One, two, three. Hello, welcome to Rock the Cash Bar. I'm Ben Mowbray. And I'm Diane Gallagher. Every week we pick one song and do a deep dive into the lyrics and explain the different ways they've been interpreted. We will also discuss how the song connected to us on a personal level, focusing on all the embarrassing details. Glad to have you here. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the 100th episode of Rock the Cash Bar, True Crime. Are you ready, Diane? I am so ready. This is this is way different than what we usually do, and I am here for it. I've got my dark beer. I'm ready. I have a sordid tale to tell you. Evil men. Dark desires. She had a heart full of love and devotion. He had a mind full of tyranny and terror. Mm. Diane, Los Angeles, California, sits on the very edge of the Western world where destiny can manifest itself no further. It's not an industrial city. It doesn't make cars like Detroit or oil and gas like Houston. No, Los Angeles traffics in stories. It manufactures the myths that come to define us. If you're not from there, or you've never tried to penetrate its lethal defenses, it's easy to think of it as a feckless town full of hopeless dreamers who deserve the heartbreak that surely waits around the next unprotected left. If someone tells you that they wanna be an actor or a writer or a musician, it's easy to dismiss them as morons tamed by the TV or ego mad me monsters on a doomed power trip. There are such unfortunates and Hollywood is full of them. But if you've ever called the city home, it's something else as well. It's a hungry baby crying in the night for more stories, more myths, more dreams, whether they be realized or crushed, the fantasy factory cries for blood. And it's a special kind of soul that answers that cry. We say they are touched or that they have the shining. High school theater geeks, quarterbacks with bad knees, guitarists with generous girlfriends, and of course, blondes with nice boobs. <laughs> this town often comes down hardest on them, but there are others as well. Non-dreamers who come to serve the rich. Rich people, Diane, are different from you and I. They've got different needs. Whole economies are in place to serve them. Adriano D'Souza was a limo driver. Tonight, his rich client was a right odd sort. He was in his late sixties, very small, long curly hair like a lady's, and his castle where D'Souza picked him up in Alhambra was impressive. Huge turrets and gates, imposing architecture. He had two dates tonight and a long list of clubs and restaurants to be seen in. D'Souza was gonna be doing a lot of parking and waiting. The rich man dispatched the first date and went on to the second, eventually dropping her off as well. For the last stop of the night, he asked Adriano to take him to LA's House of Blues, where he planned to drink in the VIP room. He emerged from the club with a stunning blonde on his arm, and told Adriano to take him back to his castle. This was a man who gets what he wants. And he's not accustomed to having to ask for it. The limo pulls through the gates and the man gets out and pissed behind the garage. I'm only staying for one drink, the woman says. She got out of the limo. Don't talk to the driver, the man screams at her. An hour later, Adriano Here's a gunshot. The man stumbles from the home. I think I just killed someone, he says. Adriano can see the woman's body crumpled and bleeding in the foyer. Diane, are you ready for the true story of Phil Spector? I am so ready. I'm so ready. <laughs> <laughs> nice and creepy. I love our whole vibe and our setup for this. Yes. <laughs> Lana grew up in Simona County, Northern California, and that's where she first heard the baby cry. 
1978, Lana was 16 years old and she was everything the hungry baby wanted. Blonde, immensely beautiful, tall and curvy in all the places that turned heads and emptied wallets. That Christmas, her father passed away and her mother moved the family to California's beautiful San Fernando Valley, where, truth be told, I once lived and nursed the baby. I know of which I speak. I felt its teeth on my own bleeding nipples. <laughs> Lana sought work as an actress and a model, and she found both. Or maybe they found her. Hollywood is full of men and women who make their business uncovering rare beauties like Lana. There's a whole power structure built around the care and feeding and eventual abandoning of particularly gorgeous women. The baby don't care. The baby only cries. The baby will only ever cry. <laughs> she landed a small role in a big movie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. The film launched the careers of several big film stars, Sean Penn, Judge Reinhold, Forrest Whitaker, Phoebe Cates, Jennifer Jason Lee. Nicholas Cage began his winding road to owning Dracula's castle on that set. But another path lay ahead for Lana. It's a horrible truth that the most attractive women in Sonoma County can get lost in the shimmering river of cascading blondes in Hollywood. That river is dammed and diverted by sandbags full of casting agents who say things like, you're pretty, but not interesting enough to play the lead, or your beauty lacks vulnerability, or why don't you meet me upstairs where we can discuss this privately? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Lana was cast in <laughs> Lana was cast in a series of small roles in film and television. You can see her dancing beside, beside Mel Michelle Pfeiffer, that interesting, vulnerable beauty at the Babylon Club in Scarface. I didn't know that. I know. That I wonder if I can watch it now. <laughs> she was an animated, statuesque glamazon, perhaps too pretty to appeal to audiences across the country. But Hollywood has Byzantine layers avenues and substrata. It's full of deal swinging grifters who know how to turn alluring flesh into gold. It's also full of hardworking technicians and specialists, real people with real skills doing real work. And Lana was fortunate enough to meet the best of these. Roger Corman, the legendary B-movie producer, cast her in his production of Death Stalker. She played a female warrior in the fantasy epic. This kind of boobs under a breastplate story for boys became her stock and trade. She would go on to swing her sacred curls and four more Roger Corman blood and sand flicks. She, she appeared for director John Landis in the film Amazon Woman on the Moon. In the early 90s, the actress grew into her 30s. Work began to dry up. She appeared in two more films, 1990s sexploitation flick The Hunting of Morella and 1996's Vice Girls, where she played a cop on an undercover assignment as a stripper. She began to appear at comic conventions where she would sell autograph copies of her films to young men who learned to love Hollywood B-movies on long Saturday nights in their basements. Men, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> just like this. But there are other kinds of men in the world. And one of these was waiting for Lana Clarkson, though she and he had no idea what kind of shit was about to go down. Well, maybe he did. He pulled this kind of shit before. In 1993, he had a lady over to the castle, played the piano for her, played a guitar for her that he said was once owned by John Lennon. He and the lady had a bit to drink and then a lot to drink. Then she passed out on the couch. So he went outside and pumped a few rounds into her car from his shotgun. When she ran outside, he chased her back in, pointed a gun at her head and screamed at her to take off her clothes. Classic. Hollywood, good time. Oh, and then there was that waitress that he met in New York who wanted to be an actress, but she probably didn't want to be an actress badly enough because he had to pull a gun on her too. She had, after all. It's hard, after all, to find a use for a woman who isn't scared to death. Did he beat a woman with a gun in a hotel in New York? Hard to say. Damn cocaine and amyl nitrates. Doesn't matter anyway. They are lucky for the chance to be with him. Yeah, he abused his wife. Ronnie, the singer, but they were married. She was his. It doesn't count. Yes, he put barbed wire fence around his house 
and stole all her shoes so she couldn't leave. Yes, he made her drive around with an inflatable doll of his likeness so that she would never be seen alone. Of course, he bought a coffin with a glass top and told her if she ever left him, he would put her corpse on display. That's what powerful men do. Yes, he once gave her twin human infants for her birthday <laughs> in an effort to tether her to these new responsibilities and to him. How does your marriage work? <laughs> Every union has its ups and downs. Life is long and there are many rooms in God's hotel. Some of them are full of guns and cocaine and women should learn to deal with it. He's in love. Lana took a... Uh, it's love. It's love, man. Lana took a job at the club. She was 40 now. Acting roles were all but gone. The comic conventions were filling up with real comic book movies and real Hollywood stars. The money was driving up. It was drying up. The baby was crying for someone else. There's no quitting Lana. This is my year, she wrote in her diary. It didn't happen for Julianne Moore until she was in her 40s. Lana was going to try her hand at comedy. A former B-movie actress in a sitcom, that could happen. What about stand-up comedy? That's open to anyone. And the clubs in LA have industry in the audience every night. She made a sizzle reel called Lana Unleashed and sent it off to the agencies. She wasn't done. She wasn't going away. She was going to feed that crying baby. So that's the professional plan. But how is Lana going to pay the rent till showbiz comes calling again? She's going to work as a hostess in the VIP lounge of the House of Blues. It pays all right. And there are plenty of chances to meet the kind of agents, producers, and showbiz hotshots who might be able to help her out. She hadn't been working there long. LA is full of VIPs. VIPs who think they are VIPs and the whole city is lousy with people who need you to believe they are VIPs. And the lounge of the House of Blues is a tough gig. On the night of February 3rd, 2003, Lana denied entrance to someone she thought was one of these. A strange old woman demanding a table. She denied her. A manager came rushing over, apologized to her, and took her to the table to the best table available. The manager returned to Lana and said, you treat him like gold. Him, she thought, a tiny man with hair like a woman. No one knows what happened in the next few hours. It is known that Lana left with him. It is known that she went to his castle. It is known that inside that castle, she died of a single gunshot to the mouth. And the last words she is known to have said is I'm only staying for one drink. That's the nightmare, Diane. That's, That's the nightmare of is. Phil Spector. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy gloomy. Reading about this story and researching it was really bizarre for me. And doing this podcast episode is going to be really strange because I think it's important to honor the memory of somebody like Lana Clarkson because yeah. I feel a lot of affinity for her because yeah. I did the same thing. You know, when I was when I was 23, I lit out to L.A. because it was time for me to go be a storyteller. You yeah. know, it was time for me to go take part in that glitz and glamour. You know, I felt that baby crying. I felt it calling to me my whole life. Yeah. I really wanted to go be a part of it. And like part of it was a sincere desire. Like I thought, this is what my talent is. This is right. what I want to do. This is what I want to devote myself to. But if I'm being wholly honest with you, the other part of it is this is how I'm going to be rich and famous. Yeah. This is how I'm going to make myself how powerful. Everyone's going to yeah. know me. I'm going to yep. bring joy to the world and they're all going to know me. And uh, mm. I'm going to make money uh, talking. <laughs> yeah the sheer danger of it is absolutely it's fascinating to me mm -hmm. you know it's and it's hard to talk about this because you don't want to you don't want to dishonor anybody's memory especially in a, in, you know in a murder as horrible as this right but it is crazy how wealth and fame can obviously protect you from the consequences of your actions yeah and that's clearly part of the reason why we seek wealth and fame oh ooh, i don't know i don't know if i seek it to get away <laughs> with murder but <laughs> <laughs> no i don't want to kill anybody but yeah. i do i do want my sins to be washed away by my success right yeah yeah, yeah. 
And you notice in Hollywood, sometimes, you know, everybody fucks up. Everybody in the world fucks up. When someone fucks up in Hollywood, though, we just want that apology. And then we're like, okay, you're good. You can entertain us again. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of times. <laughs> you know, the thing about Lana, too, is that, you know, I watched all these documentaries and stuff. And when you listen to what her friends say about her, they're like, she was legitimately funny. And this is something that could have worked for her. Um, yeah. Which breaks my heart a little bit, yeah. you know that's everything that I understood about her too. It's just like, mm -hmm. it's a vivacious energy. And to sustain that into your forties, like mm -hmm. she died. I, I think she was, I think she was only just 40, if I'm not mistaken. So she's right around our age. And to sustain that energy, to sustain that drive yeah. in the face of everybody telling you no, in the face of every audition that doesn't go your way, in the face of, of all of the roadblocks that they, they put up to keep trying to keep beating your head against the wall to keep throwing yourself out there that's an energetic person like, and it didn't an sound like desperation story. it sounded like positivity like in her diary like yeah. this is my year like she just was like it ain't over i'm still i still got mm -hmm. this i can do this i'm just gonna shift gears i'm gonna go this way now like she just sounded very positive and that's probably what led her to his house is like ah, we'll just see what happens i'll go for one drink whatever you know like she probably had no idea the dread of what was about to happen. Yeah, and there's the, there's also the idea like you could you could read that story and you could think, well, I mean, that's really foolish of you to go home with a with a strange man. Yeah. But this is a wealthy, famous guy. Mm -hmm. Like he's got a lot at stake. Everybody knows who he is. There's no way. Are you familiar with the uh, with the porn star Lisa Ann? No. Lisa Ann. I know my porn that. stars too. <laughs> Who's Lisa? I'm, not, I'm not saying you don't. I, I certainly wouldn't. I know you. <laughs> Lisa Ann played uh, Sarah Palin famously in the oh. uh, in the Who's Nailin Palin, and that made her uh, <laughs> that made her seriously famous. She makes a lot of money now as like a she's like she does like sports betting and she appears on on local sports radio shows and everything like that. Okay. And years ago, I, I heard her giving an interview where she and obviously like she's she's her appeal is that she's selling this, you know, rampant sexuality. So she was talking about the men that she dates and she says that she only dates famous men, but not because she's power hungry, but she dates them because she feels safe with them because they have so much at stake. Right. Like she knows that when she goes home with a, with an athlete, like obviously he's got a nice body and a lot of money. So that's going to be fun for her. Yes, but she also knows that, yeah, like this guy's not going to hurt me or kill me like the way some random stranger might, you know, like, like there's a, a level of safety that's there. And I think that must be what, what Lana was feeling that night as well. Like for not sure. only could this guy help my career potentially, but also he's not going to hurt me. He's Phil yeah. Spector, the famous music producer. He worked with the fucking Beatles and John Lennon. And she probably had, Z I mean, obviously she didn't know who he was. She thought he was a lady. Um, mm. but she didn't know about his marriage to Ronnie Spector and what he did there. She didn't know the stories of him wielding a gun in the production studio, which we'll talk about later. She knew nothing. And he probably... Mm -hmm. He's probably like most um, bipolar sociopaths. He was probably charming. He was on his best fucking behavior until he got her into Ooh. his house. Without a doubt. Yeah. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. It was amyl nitrates, apparently, that was his thing. It was the big poppers. Do you ever see Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas when they do yeah. the mm, yeah. one for the doctor? Ooh. Okay. Yeah. I've never done that. I've never seen anybody do that. I think that's one of those like 70s drugs that yeah. kind of disappeared before, it before you and I got to do them. Yeah, I went away with like quaaludes. Have you seen a quaalude in your life? <laughs> I've never even heard of a quaalude in my life. <laughs> We're on to Oxycontin now. <laughs> right. Yikes. Never, as far as I know, I've never been around anybody who's doing heroin. Like I know, I've obviously I know people who have done it, but I don't think I've ever been around it. I've never witnessed it. Yeah, no, me either. Me either. I don't think there's anything to witness. I think that's just that's just fading into the couch. But yeah. the cocaine and the cocaine psychosis. Yeah. Oh, that's what got all over Phil Spector, which can happen. He was 21 years old when he was a millionaire. When I say it can happen, like obviously I'm not forgiving him. Right. But he was 21 years old. He was yeah. his genius record producer. He created the wall of sound, which I don't really understand. Like I know it when I hear it. Like when I hear like the Righteous Brothers do Unchained Melody or, or, or some of the songs by the, uh, by the Ronettes and Be My Baby, like that classic early 60s sound. I love it. I hear it. And I know that he's the guy behind it, but I don't really understand how it works. Like I don't, I don't when somebody says the wall of sound, like I know what it is, but like, okay, but what is it? I know. I want 
Oh my God. I was talking to Corbin about this today. And so apparently it has an effect. So my son has grown up hearing all kinds of music. He plays guitar, everything. So I'm today, I'm watching like some stuff on YouTube and I put on the Ronettes Be My Baby. And my son usually just doesn't care about what I'm watching if it's not something he wants to watch. And he's drawing and he looks up and he watches the whole video and he's moving his head and tapping. And he turns to me and he goes, what is this? This is the best thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, what does this do to people? My son <laughs> got it. And he's heard yeah. now music, you know? I mean, I think it's Ronnie's voice, but apparently, I mean, cause we do mass studio productions and all of our music now, he started this, you know, but it, it had an effect on my seven-year-old. It's crazy. And, you know, obviously I've done all this research on the wall of sound and I have questions and confusion about it. So I don't know for the listeners, if anybody is young and dumb like me and just needs like a recap on the wall of sound, let me just read this. The wall of sound also called the specter sound is a music production formula developed by a Phil at Gold Star Studios in the 1960s with assistance from engineer Larry, is it Levine? I'm guessing it's Levine. And the conglomerate yeah. of session musicians later known as the Wrecking Crew. And this is the people that Phil would only work with. He only trusted these people. The intention was to exploit the possibilities of studio recording to create an unusually dense orchestral aesthetic that came across well through radios and jukeboxes of the era. So the idea was the sound was for, I mean, because everything was jukebox and radio, everything. I mean, and that's what the sound was for. And this is, I have a question about this, but I'll, I'll bring it up later. Specter explained in 1964, I was looking for a sound, a sound so strong that if the material was not the greatest, the sound would carry the record. It was a case of augmenting. It all fit together like a jigsaw. So I, I won't read this whole thing, but basically it, he called it a Wagnerian, Wagnerian approach to rock and roll, little symphonies for the kids. And um, that was from uh, the operas of R Richard Wagner. That's why that yeah. term came about. But basically he would just have this dense studio recording room and he would have a song playing in the background and then have the singer sing over their own recording and then have multiple guitars, like a regular bass and a stand-up bass. And then like acoustic guitars and electric guitars, just as much... I'm sorry, as much instruments going as, as possible and just this, this like layered sound, which, and then I guess you work with it in post-production, but the problem, I, I cannot find an answer to this anywhere. I'm like, but what happens when they perform live? Right. You can't reproduce yeah. all that live. So does it sound like shit live? Because when you watch these old recordings of like the Ronettes and everybody singing on TV shows, they're lip singing. And so I'm like, yeah. what did that do to live performances though? And I cannot find anyone asking that question or any answer to that anywhere. I think he must've had like, like, like obviously uh, 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 the, the Ronettes, they have that, that masterful voice at the, at the very beginning of it. So when they perform live, like he must've been looking for the, for the musicians who could do both. Like they could fit into the, into the wall of sound. And then when they perform live, they can still be that masterful and it might be shocking to the to the audience to like okay you don't have the wall of sound anymore but now you have this raw sound yeah. coming at you that's being generated by the people on stage and that creates like a live excitement as well okay you know yeah. like you can you can you can fake it in the studio and then deliver something different live that's still going to be surprising you know we did uh, an episode on, on nick cave last week and I went to go see him in Los Angeles and I've listened to his songs over and over and over again. He loves the crescendo. Like he yeah. loves to end the song on the big booming, you know, big booming power chord. I've heard so many different versions of his songs, but live he was still able to surprise like when the crescendo lands. Like I don't know much uh -huh. about music or how beats and measures work, but he was just off of your expectation, just that little bit that it becomes very, very satisfying. It's like, okay, that's a version that I'll never hear again. And I think that's, I think that's how the wall of sound works live. I could be wrong, that, I don't know. That had to be factored in because like, you know, I've been to concerts where I was like, this band sucks live. And it is the time, first time I was like, oh, I listened to an overproduced album. That's what happened yeah. and they couldn't pull it off live. And that's the only thing that I think about when I think about the wall of sound, but the people who were 
using this method were, you know, the Righteous Brothers and the Ronettes and, you know, everyone that was famous, you know, the, you know, the Beatles, everyone. And so obviously it was fine. <laughs> I'm the only one who's questioning this. <laughs> We should also mention that that Ronnie Spector passed a couple of days ago. Yes. Like we've been we've been planning this episode for a little while. This is going to be our our hundredth episode. Like you and I both love true crime podcasts. Who doesn't? We're yes. not parodying a true crime podcast. We're doing a true crime podcast. Right. Like I want to do it. I'm doing this sincerely. Like I, I, I get yes. I get into it. But Ronnie Spector passed away a couple of days ago, and her life with Phil Spector is terrifying. Awful. Like it's Nightmare. absolutely terrifying. Yeah. And then, and, and for her personally, for her family, obviously, but then you think of like, like the history of the world and the history of music as we know it, John Lennon was in love with Ronnie Spector. Oh, like before. Well, how did I miss this? Tell me all about this. Yeah. I, I don't know too much about it. I just did a little bit of, I just did a little bit of research, but apparently before he met Yoko Ono, John Lennon was absolutely smitten kitten with Ronnie Spector and why wouldn't you be? I she's mean, a she's cutie gorgeous. pop. She looks like she's shorter than me, teeny tiny, and just that gorgeous mix. It was like, she had like an Irish dad and then like a Cherokee black ma. I mean, just makes beautiful people. <laughs> yeah, 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 she was, was like absolutely like, like no one you've ever seen, just like a completely unique look. And then that beautiful, fluid, full voice. I mean, that just like absolutely captivating. They would do, like, obviously we're talking about like the late 50s, early 60s, as the, as the Ronettes are, are coming up. Uh, fashion obviously was a little bit different. Women kind of hid themselves a little bit. The Ronettes were one of the first groups that came out and started selling themselves um, with sexuality. Like yeah. they would put on a lot of makeup. They would wear tight dresses. They would yeah. wear, you know, like they, and the skirts would be very, very high up. Like they were, they were definitely selling their their sexuality and they were one of the first people to do it so the cat calls and the whistles of course would, would would come running down and that's when that that sexuality kind of arrived in rock yeah. and roll you know yeah. what i mean like with elvis like you've got you've got squealing girls and frank sinatra you know did it you know 10 years you know before that it's a different sort of thing once you have the female sexuality out there because men are just a little more is rabid the word that i'm looking for Maybe, maybe more, like, you know what's weird about it is it gets the females excited. I watched that video I told you today, and it was like a you know a, a stage performance with an audience, and it would kept showing the audience, and there were just like white girls screaming the way they did for the Beatles and stuff. I mean, it's an energy that affects everybody, and probably exciting for these girls. Like, I want to do that, <laughs> you know? It's crazy. Yeah. But so so Phil Spector works with the with the Ronettes and obviously like like Ronnie has has this incredible voice. He falls in love with her and marries her and then very very quickly starts to become the incredibly possessive guy yeah. that like I, like like to a, a degree like in the the overwrought prose that I, that I wrote not a word of it is untrue. Like he literally put barbed wire fence around his house so that she couldn't get out. He yeah. literally took all of her shoes so that it would be harder for her to run away. That it just made gets me more laugh and more crazy. So hard because he they talk about that so much that he kept thinking in his mind, if she doesn't have her shoes, she can't run away. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he what would was, make her so weird. He had a blow-up doll of his likeness made. So like if she was if she had to I don't know, like obviously if he's got barbed wire and, and he took her shoes, I don't know. At, on what occasion she's going to be driving around by herself but if that ever happened she had to blow up an inflatable likeness of her husband so that she would never appear in public without him oh my god and then what was the thing like after they divorced he still said he was gonna hire seven hitmen to come to her next performance and one of them they would shoot her dead like live on it's stage insane. It's insane. And it keeps getting worse. Like, it, like you, you read about the glass topped coffin he kept in his house, promising her that if she ever left him, he would murder her and put her corpse on display. You think that would be scary enough, but it isn't like he can top even that. He literally went out and adopted infant human twins. He didn't like, baby, I'm going to buy you a dog. He went out and got two human beings and human said, beings. you're their mother now. 
staying here with me. It's frightening on a level I couldn't even comprehend. Like, I, obviously, I've known about the Phil Spector story since 2003 when it happened, and I knew he was abusive. I knew he was. I had until I, until this week when I started researching, I had no idea. The no clue what a monster this That's, was. And then then he looks like a monster in his old age. Like he looked like the the what was on the inside came out to the outside. He just looked yeah. terrifying. Mm -hmm. Why do we allow it? How do we allow it? Like how many people around that guy, you know, must have, have either dismissed that behavior or not intervened, not said anything, not done anything as yeah. he went crazier and crazier and crazier. And I don't mean to be an asshole, but the scary thing about it is I'm a man, you know, like, like obviously this guy is a million times more extreme than, than I am. And this is a horrible thing to admit, and I'm going to try to say it as delicately and hopefully as precisely as I can. But I think men, I think part of the reason why men get fascinated with these stories is because we sort of understand. Like we sort of understand the feeling. We sort of understand what it's like to, 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 to want to possess a woman as fully as, as this guy went out and did. It's not that we admire it. It's not that we look up to it or aspire to it. It's just that like, like, like we understand that there's a deep, deep darkness in our souls and we got to stay the fuck away from that right. or you could wind up in that territory. And then it's this horrible mixture of he became hideous looking. And well, I can talk later about this like really bad car wreck that he was in that really fucked up his appearance even more. And that's when he started wearing the crazy wigs because he had like 300 stitches in his head and stuff. But it's this horrible mixture of like, obviously he had mental illness. He was diagnosed as Bo uh, I said Bo Piler. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Bipolar. He was, he was diagnosed as Pol Pot. <laughs> um, bipolar, he was um, crazy. He had so much money and blazing insecurity. I mean, that's just a mixture for crazy for, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, that's the, that's the, the, the formula for the Phil Spectres mm -hmm. who do things like this. Yeah. Infinite levels. Like you can insulate yourself from absolutely anything and LA or like, I mean, our American culture or just human nature in general uh, sort of allows that. Like once you get to a certain level of, of wealth and power, you can buy the law. Everybody knows it. You can buy the lawyers. You can convince anybody of anything. It's, yeah. it's gross. It's horrible. Around the same time that Phil Spector was uh, on trial for, uh, for the murder of his wife, uh, for, excuse or me, for the murder of, of Lana Clarkson, Robert Blake, the TV actor, was on trial for the murder of his wife. And Robert Blake is maybe not to the degree the monster that Phil Spector is, but he's still a murderer. He murdered his wife in a, in a restaurant in uh, in Los Angeles, and he got off. And of course, like the the grim thing, like like Phil Spector was 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 convicted, and you can kind of see the corruption right there. Like it's not it's not bold face, it's not encoded into law but you can kind of see it staring at you. It was just like, okay, like, like Robert Blake is convicted, or, or excuse me, is, is, is not convicted of, of, of murdering his own wife because that's your own wife. You can go ahead and do that. Phil Spector is convicted of murdering a party girl. That's yeah. community property, man. That's not okay. That is not all right. Don't damage the party girls. It's so do upsetting. what you want in your own home. But yeah. Don't. Mm. Yeah, that's the, the, the message. The mm -hmm. way they tried to, you know, the only thing that they had was just like, oh, she was just this party girl, and like, you know, because well, we haven't mentioned for people who don't know the story, Phil says she bit the gun. He says it was an accident that she put it in. Her, she bit the gun, and yeah, the or first she kissed the gun. She so, kissed yeah. the gun. She put it, yeah. And yep. then it went off. And so the first thing I did when I was starting my research on this, and this was horrible, because if this is the first and only thing you watch, you may think he's innocent. But I watched that HBO movie that they made where Al Pacino plays Phil Spector. And um, it's all the whole story is told from the side of his attorneys and what they were trying to do to find him innocent. And it's this whole thing about the blood splatter. Like, you know, there was this expert that come in and said, like, if the she had 
if he was holding the gun in her mouth at this angle that the angle was at when it killed her, he would have been covered in her blood and he wasn't. And, and that's kind of where they leave it at the end where it almost makes you are like, oh, well, did he do it? And then you're hearing, you know, Al Pacino play Phil Spector and t- telling his side of the story. And then you go back and do all the research and you're like, why the fuck was that movie even made? Because he obviously yeah. did it and this is bullshit. But I guess to show you like why the jury was hung the first one, because the first trial was a hung jury. Um, and then the second trial, they found him guilty. Right. It's so terrifying because I like, it, 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 this is a story of, of, of masculinity, you know, like, like obviously like, like run rampant. Yeah. It, it's it, it, like, here's, it, it seems to me like Phil Spector was a guy who through his insecurities and his, and his drug use and his abusive nature and everything like that, he wanted to be seen as the dangerous guy. Yeah. You know, he wanted to be, he wanted to be wild. Like he, like he liked the fear that he would see in women's eyes. I mean, there's no other reason why you would pull guns on multiple women over the yeah. course of decades. Like, unless, like, obviously you're manipulative, obviously you're insecure, but there must be part of you that enjoys seeing the terror in their eyes. Like, like seeing that, that, that you are Mr. Dangerous. Yeah. But what women want from, like, like or what, or, like, I know what women want. Tell me what women know. want, Ben. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Your masculinity, your strength is supposed to provide security, right. protection, safety, you know, like, and, and, and like your, your sexuality is obviously is like, it's exciting. So you're supposed to, you kind of spin against the way you drive, you know, that's what right. kink is all about. You know, that's right. why, you know, do you, do you like to be tied up? Do you like to be right. gagged or something like that? You're dramatizing the sexual act. You know, there's a, there's a point in the way humans make love where the woman has to surrender to the man and the man has to take over like like that's the that's the drama of sexuality and what kink is is just heightening that and heightening that and heightening that right. and i think that's what happened with phil specter is he like it wasn't it no longer it wasn't a private thing anymore like it became a lifestyle it was just i am danger i yeah. am evil like and same like, thing with with like guys like marilyn manson like yes and, and power hungry because he didn't just pull guns on women. He did it in the studio in front of famous musicians as well. Like he would fire it in studio and, yeah. and wave it around and stuff. And, you know, so there's, <clears throat> I have quotes of some guys, like two of the Ramones see it very differently. One of the Ramones was like, yeah, it was fucked up. He pulled guns on us. And the other Ramon was like, oh, I was fine. He had a license to carry. We could have left anytime we want. That's two guys in the same room feeling differently about this psycho, you know? Um, yeah. But it was a power, like he was a little man who was told way too early that he was a genius and um, had to deal with that internally and be bipolar um, and be insecure. <laughs> like, what a nightmare. I mean, it just created a monster. It's a perfect storm. Like, it's, yeah. it's a weird, like, 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 how did this even happen? Like, it's just a, a, just a weird cascade of coincidences that, that led to an absolute fucking nightmare. And also, how do you pull a gun on Leonard Cohen? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> you tell uh, me. I don't know. I have no idea how it happens. Like, 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 obviously it's about control. You know, it's, it's about, uh, like, like if you're in his studio, if you're in his castle, if you're in his orbit, then you need to understand that he's the fucking guy in charge. And if you don't understand that, he's going to make you understand that. Like it's, it's, that's just the way that monsters work. It's, 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 it's ego, ego, ego. And then you throw cocaine on top of that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yikes. I keep forgetting about the cocaine. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What a flair that is in a lot of Hollywood gunplay. Mm-hmm. The, uh, and it's it, like everything about this guy smacks of do you know who I am? Like, yes. Everything about it has that like, like, I mean, obviously, like, like I, I really do believe that that part of the reason why Lana Clarkson ended up being the woman that he murdered and not any of the other women, many other women that he pulled guns on is because his relationship with Lana Clarkson started just a few hours before and it started with her not knowing who he is. Yeah. Like, she, like, he went up to the velvet rope, you know, he's, he's fucking Phil Spector and you're going to deny me entrance to the VIP section of the House of Blues yeah. in Los Angeles? Fuck you. 
Yeah. I'm going to show you who I am. Exactly. Like I, I wouldn't, I, I obviously, you know, I've been drunk. I've done drugs. My brain has led me to some stinking thinking at times in my life. I've done things that I regret. I could totally see a timeline where somebody who's done so much more and has so much more insecurity than I do would get to a point where they would almost instantly make that decision. You know, just like I am like in that moment, like you're not letting me behind that velvet rope. I'm gonna hurt you. Yeah. I'm going to. Like what, the manager what coming over and chastising you is ego. not gonna be enough. That's yeah. crazy. A fragile little ego <laughs> had to had to show her what's up. So I have this, I was gonna do this like timeline for people who like honestly, I knew of spill. <laughs> What is wrong with me? I almost said spill factor. What the fuck is happening me, to me tonight, Ben? <laughs> it's We're been, having a very weird episode. That's what's happening. It's gosh. been a day. Yeah. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God, what is wrong with me? Um, and like, it just, this is me editing and editing and editing and trying to just get the basics of this man's life down. And it is three goddamn pages. And we've covered some of it, but um. I do want, there are some things that I think are important because like, I didn't know much about him and maybe for some of the listeners, they don't know much. So I'm just going to give you a couple things that we haven't mentioned, starting with his early life, because this one thing I do, I find very interesting. So <clears throat> I'll just read this. Um, he was born December 26, 1939. His grandparents were immigrants and the similarities in the name and background of his grandfathers have led to speculation by Specter that his parents were first cousins. Um, I only Ooh. mentioned this because, well, it might explain some shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the difference of like, you know, first cousins, but I mean, I think it happened a lot in history. I mean, it's not like, you know, they were brother and sister, but you know, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. Um, mm -hmm. But in 1949, when Phil was 10 years old, his father committed suicide. That's a whole trauma thing that we haven't gotten into. Um, but on his gravestone were inscribed the words, Ben Spector, father, husband, to know him was to love him. Um, mm -hmm. So fast forward, that's one of the first hits. That's one of the first like big hit songs that he writes. Um, I think that was with uh, the teddy bears. And so um, I'm not going to get into every single band and every single song that he made people can do their own research if they want just go to wikipedia there's a whole list um but like in 1960 he co-wrote the ben e king uh top 10 spanish harlem and also worked as a session musician playing uh guitar solo on the drifter song on broadway he was like this is before he turned 21 years old i right when he turned 21 like that's insane yeah. that's insane to be yeah. that famous and doing things that big what were you doing at 21? Like we talk about this all the time, yep. how crazy that is. Yeah. I was smoking cigarettes in the back of a comedy club. I mean, shut up. Like, come on. I wasn't even there yet. I didn't start doing comedy until I was like 27. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> I want to talk about his behavior. So by the mid 1970s, Spectre had produced 18 US top 10 singles for various artists. His chart toppers included The Righteous Brothers, You've Lost That Loving Feeling, The Beatles, The Long and Winding Road, and Harrison's My Sweet Lord. Um, following one-off productions for Leonard Cohen and the Ramones, Spectre remained largely inactive amid a lifestyle of seclusion, drug use, and increasingly erratic behavior. So I just have some examples of his erratic behavior in the studio. This isn't even the women thing. This is just studio shit. So... Harrison and Spectre started work on Harrison's Living in the Material World album in October 72, but Spectre's unreliability soon led to Harrison dismissing him from the project. Harrison recalled having to climb down into Spectre's central London hotel room from the roof to get him to attend the sessions, and um, that Spectre would need 18 cherry brandies before he could get himself down to the studio. 18? Oh God. <laughs> 18. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm not yet. Yeah, I'm collapsing. Also, like, how do you, like, can you imagine, like, 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 My Sweet Lord is one of the most beautiful songs ever written and performed. Like, if you're how ever having Harrison any problem whatsoever, you could, I, I, like, literally with a gun to his head, is that how My Sweet Lord came into this world? Like, <laughs> holy mean, living crap. No way, Dude. right? There had to be like, certain you, people I mean, he would do this with and certain people like, well, I can't do this with, you know, very mm -hmm. Christian Harrison. I can't do that. You get in that room and you fucking soothe some human souls or I'm going to blow your fucking head off. <laughs> My sweet Lord. <laughs> like, okay, <all> right. <laughs> um, 
yeah, Spectre brandished uh, his handguns and at one point fired a shot while Lennon was recording. Like, can you fathom Lennon being like, ha, I have a good one, Phil. Like, what? Yeah. Like, what? Like, that guy's great. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Peace and Love is just like, well, it's just one of the tools in his box, isn't it? Yeah, like, right? <laughs> Uh, also, his wife is fucking hot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm going to read this part because I have issue with what this writer is trying to say about Phil. Um, as the 70s progressed, Spectre became increasingly reclusive. The most probable and significant reason for his withdrawal, according to biographer Dave Thompson, was that in 1974, he was seriously injured when he was thrown through the windshield of his car in a crash in Hollywood. He suffered serious head injuries that required several hours of surgery with over 300 stitches to his face and more than 400 to the back of his head. His head injuries, Thompson suggests, were the reason that Spectre began, uh, began his habit of wearing outlandish wigs in later years. Um, I do not agree with this idea that he became crazier and weirder after this crash because we have way too much evidence from Ronnie that he was crazy before this. Yeah, absolutely. I don't buy that either. I, yeah. I don't buy that that's cranial trauma or anything like that. I don't, you know, it may have made it a little bit worse. It may have made him even more insecure and even right. more defensive, but there's no way that that's where it began. Like it just, this guy was just, there are monsters among us. Like there are foul souls who, who yeah. come up. Like there are people, like if you don't, if you don't do the work, like if you don't recognize that, that there's evil in the hearts of every man and it's every man's duty to turn away from that evil like some men do and some men don't and some men get caught in between and some men just get enmeshed in it yeah. I, I really think that that's all there is to it yeah you know, i think look like look, look, look at that at, at marilyn manson like that guy was hiding in plain sight for for 30 years like he was just straight up saying like i am wallowing in it i am filling my brain with all of these misogynistic masochistic revenge fantasies like 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 I'm, I'm expressing them i'm only living in those you know like like clearly it was something right. that he was that he was also manifesting in his real life like right. there's you can't let your you can't let the darkness that's going on in your brain come into your real life like you have to suppress it you have to it's not your real self and i think that's what artists run into you know i think that's why it happens to, to phil specter at the marilyn manson or even guys like johnny depp you know, it's just like, like if you want to be your authentic self, then you think that your your dark thoughts, your impolite thoughts, the ones that are going to offend people are the ones that you need to express in order to be your authentic self. I don't think that's true. Like, yeah, like, what I learned in therapy is you are not your thoughts. Some people can't yeah. separate that. Some people, we all have dark shit in our mind. We all have dark thoughts, but they're just thoughts. And what you learn in therapy, because, you know, people who aren't completely insane start having guilt for these thoughts. And then you learn, like, they're just thoughts. You're not yeah. your thoughts. And the people who can, like, oh, thank God, they're just thoughts. And then there's people who can't. And then, then they act on them thinking that's who my authentic self is. And then that's, they have a tortured mind that they live out. Yeah, you got to, you have to turn away from the wall or there's nothing at all. But then you have true psychos. Like, I always wanted to write a joke about this. Like, if someone had just told Jeffrey Dahmer he is not his thoughts, could everything have come yeah. out differently? <laughs> <laughs> if he'd only seen my therapist, it all could have worked out, right? <laughs> I don't think it works for everybody. The true psychos are like, no, I'm my thoughts. I want to eat people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I want to tell this story because I don't know this. Okay, so, and I cannot find this on YouTube and if someone please send it to me if you find it. So Spectre remained inactive through most of the 80s, 90s and early 2000s. In 1989, Tina Turner inducted Spectre into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a non-performer. So check this out. Spectre hit the stage bopping madly to the strains of Ronette's Be My Baby, flanked by three beefy bodyguards who practically elbowed Tina out of the way. He mumbled a few incoherent words about George Bush and the presidential inauguration, and then his bodyguards carried him away. Obviously, a mental basket case uh, mixed with asshole. That was my word at the end. Um, 
1994, he wrote a letter to the Hall of Fame uh, nominating committee opposing the Ronettes being considered for induction. He argued that the group was not a proper recording act and did not contribute enough to music to merit an induction. More evidence was uh, that he was a fucking asshole and the Ronettes were eventually inducted into the Hall of Fame, but not until 2007. Damn. What a fucking dick. Um, this is an incredibly bruised ego. I think I, 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 I read a lot of articles about him, so maybe I'm getting something wrong. I apologize if I am. I think it was at Ike's funeral that Phil Spector came to speak. At the time, he was literally on trial for the murder of Lana Clarkson. Ike Turner, of course, obviously notoriously abused Tina Turner. Right. Phil Spector got up there and 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 started talking about how when it came to Ike and Tina, he, he started saying that that Ike was the real talent there. Yes. That, that Tina was like it's insane. Like like he is. Just, I read that quote and teen. he was a fucking dickhead. I was just like, oh, yeah. he sees Ike and's like, you know, these bitches deserve this shit. You know, yeah, yeah, you're the star. Exactly. Uh -huh. G's up, hose down, right, Ike? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, fucking shit. Um, all right. So, I mean, I had all this other stuff, but I, I don't, there's all this stuff about like what people have said about his legacy and influence. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> like, I just don't care. Um, I will say that it's like, according, according to Stevie, Stevie Van Zandt of the E Street Band, Spectre was a genius, irredeemably conflicted. Uh, on Twitter, he wrote, Spectre was the ultimate, ultimate example of the art always being better than the artist. Uh, he made some of the greatest records in history based on the salvation of love while remaining incapable of giving or receiving love his whole life. Um, yeah. Which I think is the only like kind of, not even a tribute, but like kind of explanation from a from a famous person that I'll accept right now because I just don't want to hear anything good about him. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. Yeah, it's it's absolutely insane. The articles when when he when he passed away, you know, the the, the headlines were insane, and they and obviously they came in for uh, for Twitter criticism and everything like that. But there were so many that was just like a, a record producer Phil Spector whose legacy was marred by his ego or sort of like marred by his ego like he murdered a he person somebody he killed a person yeah like it's it's not it's I don't I don't understand like I like obviously like like you can your influence can become so big that that you have to consider other aspects but at what point do we actually like like come down and just go okay yeah it's I yeah. I don't know like my brain melts when I think about it when I when I see the way that he was uh paid tribute to and the, and the things that were written about him in passing as right. if we're supposed to ignore this inc a lifetime of horrible things you yeah know, it's, it's like, like if it's Harvey Weinstein dies and everybody's like oh but he was so great <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's all we're not talking about one night. We're not talking about one coke fueled accident. We're talking about a lifetime of yeah. abuse, like a yeah. lifetime of miserable behavior. Like it's you, can you separate the art from the artist? Like is what is that even the question? Yeah, like, no, this guy is just an asshole. Yeah, um, I guess we also, never said you've lost that love and feeling is a great song. I mean, it's pretty damn good, um, but he yeah. didn't sing it, you know, I mean, yeah. fuck him. Uh, I guess we should explain how he died. We didn't even say that uh, in 2009, after spending three decades in semi-retirement, he was convicted for the 2003 murder of Lana Clarkson and sentenced to 19 years in life for prison. He died in prison in 2021 from complications of COVID. COVID-19, <laughs> COVID-19. I think it bears observing that he murdered her in February of 2003 and didn't go to jail until 2009. So he had six more years of coke snorting in his castle. Not insane. That insane. Ain't life works. wonderful? <laughs> Haven't we built a great world for our children? Sorry, I'm getting cynical. I'm getting, I'm getting down to the bottom of my glass of red wine and I've been sitting in menacing candlelight for a while. I'm in yeah. a mood. I apologize. Well, well, you know what? Let's move away from this for a second. And uh, we finally have the new segment from Jeremy Essig. Let's find, I'm not even going to say what it's called yet because I'm going to let him tell us. You ready to see it? Let's do it, Jeremy. 
Hey friends, welcome to my hotel room in Indianapolis and the rather somber debut of this year's iteration of Six Degrees of Tommy Stinson, Six Degrees of Tinted Windows. After over a year of connecting to the bass player of the replacements, I thought it might be a fun challenge to look at a new target, and in doing so, why not use the strangest supergroup of all time, Tinted Windows. Frequent listeners of the show may remember that I briefly mentioned Tinted Windows on an early episode of Six Degrees. This was the band that consisted of drummer Bunny Carlos of Cheap Trick, bassist Adam Schlesinger from Fountains of Wayne, guitarist James Ehoff, Smashing Pumpkins, and singer Taylor Hansen of, well, Hansen. This super odd group put out one self-titled debut in 2009, and I thought the members' differing backgrounds might lead to some fun musical detours in 2022. Unfortunately, this segment's debut comes under the cloud of sadness with the passing yesterday of Ronnie Spector. Brought to international success with a slew of hits in the early 60s, penned and produced by this week's cash bar subject, Phil Spector, Ronnie Spector would return to prominence once again in the 1980s, singing the hook on Eddie Money's Take Me Home Tonight. That would lead to her second solo album, Unfinished Business, in 1987, which featured the track Up on the Rooftop, a song co-written by Desmond Child. Desmond Child is a prodigious songwriter who has credits on everything from Kiss songs to Cisco's Thong song, and was also the co-writer of Weird, the fourth single from Middle of Nowhere, the debut album of Hanson. So, from Ronnie Spector to Desmond Child to Hanson to Tinted Windows. From Indianapolis, back to Diana Bed. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Hanson of Hanson. Of, of Hanson. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is super exciting. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he's great. I mean, obviously, you can sit and you can do the research and everything like that, but all of that is floating around in his head. It's amazing to me. It's I've never amazing. heard of tinted windows, and I, I like when I texted him, I was like, "How have I never heard of this bizarre supergroup?" <laughs> so funny, <laughs> smashing pumpkins and cheap trick and Hanson. It sounds like a joke. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man! One hundred episodes. We did 100. it. One hundred. Congratulations, Ben. I didn't think we would make it this far, and mm -hmm. here we are. You got a hundred more in you? I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think we'll um, probably do it too. All right. So next week, uh, it's going to be a Patreon episode. In December, we drew uh, Josh Hall, who is a friend of mine from high school. And what's funny is he told me we're going to do a Morrissey song, and I got like super excited. And then he told me the song, and I was like, "How the fuck did you just give me a Morrissey song that I don't know?" <laughs> Because Whoa. I think I kind of, I didn't realize this. I was so much more of a Smiths fan. And I think I kind of dropped Morrissey a little bit after Bona Drag. So maybe you know it, but we're doing boxers. Boxers. I'm into it. Do you know Let's it? Let's do it. I do not know it off the top of my head. I but know. Also, here's the thing. Like my, my, my Smiths knowledge, like I, I know all of their songs. Like, like, yeah. like I'm a much bigger Smiths fan than I am a Morrissey fan. Me too. But all of my I think I think I have every Morrissey album but they were given to me like like on cassettes and mixtapes and things like that so I may not know the name of the song but I bet I do know it yeah like I bet I went and listened to it and I was like I really don't know it um but it's exciting because I'm never unhappy with Morrissey lyrics never ever I mean I'm unhappy with the man yep. he has become now <laughs> uh but uh so I'm sure it's gonna be great so that is next week we're on a dark run, man. I Nick know. Cave, Phil Spector, Morrissey. We'll do somebody joyous next. We'll do somebody joyous next time. It'll be fine. I, I don't know who we're going to do, but it's going to be, <laughs> we're going to, Candy Cane Lane, Candy <laughs> Cane Lane. Okay, Diane, right. be safe. And? Be safe. Don't get murdered. Love you. Bogue. Bogue. So what you say you love me. Rock the Cash Bar is produced by Diane Gallagher. Music by Chuck Savage and Eddie Hawkins. Special thank you to Jeremy Essig for Six Degrees and to Sarah Wessling for the guilty pleasures of vocals. Our website is rockthecashbarpodcast.com and there you can find links to our Spotify playlist and to our Patreon. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you next week. <laughs>